Neil, uh, it is a great pleasure to finally get a chance to meet you. I've been a fan for a long time. In fact, I was watching your most recent, uh, well, I was watching one of your TED Talks and I sh watched it with my whole family last night. You made me smile, you made me cry, and then you made me really happy. And you gave, I tell you, my family and I um, approach today a little differently because we watched it. So it's a real honor to get to meet you, um, but I have a couple questions for you, if I may. Yes, you may. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, you know, your messages are, I think, very, very powerful, and you've learned through experience. Um, I'm a business leader. I'm responsible for business, and, and the people who uh, watch my videos and listen to my and, and read my blogs are sort of our, our leaders who are focused on, on the challenges of leadership. Um, you know, many of us uh, are taught uh, that we should be focused on profit. We should be focused on the bottom line and that these other skills uh, are soft skills. But what do you think about the focus that leaders should have as it relates to um, that, that challenge? Yeah. Well, talk, hearing you talk about that corporate focus, doesn't actually sound that different than how I grew up. You know, my mom is uh, from Nairobi, Kenya. My dad is from Amritsar, India. So they were immigrants to Canada. And when they grew up, they said, Neil, it's real simple. You do great work, then you have a big success, and then you be happy. It's the kind of classic parenting advice. Sometimes I ask people, you know, have you heard this advice before? Have you given it before? And everyone's like, yeah, that sounds normal. You study hard, then you get good grades. And if you're East Indian, you become a doctor, right? right. Or you uh, work really hard, and in the corporate environment, you get promoted, and then you're happy. But the model I like to like to put forward is is a reverse of like a profit focused model, and instead it's 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 happiness focused. So, like I said, it's not great work to big success to be happy. It's be happy leading to great work, leading to a big success. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you as a leader can invest in your employees' happiness and well-being at the beginning, then we know from all kinds of research. Uh, Sonia Lebomirsky did an incredible um, study based on the uh, book, the, Hap the How of Happiness, that shows that your productivity goes up 31%. If you're in a sales-based role, and most people, well, many people are, they, sales goes up 37%. Creativity goes up three times. This is from just being happy. And then what happens after is you have the big success at the end. I'm talking about career success. You're more likely to get promoted if you're in a good place at work and you have a positive mindset. And also, you live longer. You live about 10 extra years. So zooming out from profit, like just t ignore that for a second. If you actually want those variables, productivity, creativity, sales, out of your employees, the biggest investment you can make is on their happiness at the front side. Wow, that that was very helpful, and certainly all those statistics were were, were very helpful too. I, that's a, a great perspective, which I agree with. And you know, I, I like to tell the story of um, this this tweet I put out on Twitter, saying, you know, what's more important, you know, the shareholder, the customers, or employees? And one of the greatest answers I got back was is um, that leaders should focus on uh, happy employees equals happy customers equals happy shareholders. So I completely agree with your your view there. Um, in my book, we all. I talk about how everybody wins when we comes before me um, and uh, so the role so I talk about we and a lot about the team uh, but there's an individual inside there as well um, so how what advice would you have for individuals who come to work every day about how they can be great on their own and and a great teammate it's a great question um, and you asked me before if you should show me the questions of his. I said no, because I'd like to have more of a conversation is what we're able to do. And you know, I think that's the biggest thing I'd like to share with you is uh, there's something, a model I, I, I call the 20 for 20 challenge. The 20 for 20 challenge. What I'm trying to say is if you can commit for 20 minutes a day, for 20 days in a row, to do a small, simple happiness exercise, then you can invest in yourself at the beginning. What are some examples? Not all of these, you just pick one, okay? It's a 20 minute brisk nature walk or it's a 20 minute journaling exercise, or it's a 20 minute meditation, or it's committing a conscious act of kindness, a nice email to somebody, buying a flower for somebody, right? Or writing down five gratitudes. Any of those five, remember the nature walk, the journaling exercise, the meditation, the random act of kindness, or the five gratitudes will invest and convert your positive mindset for the remainder of the day. So if you are a boss or you're an employee, where's that 20 minutes? I, I guarantee everyone's saying, yeah, I got to like kind of scoot to this meeting at lunch. Or maybe, maybe people say like, you know, I've got to um, go grab a sandwich or something. But very few people say, well, I've got to go meditate. Or I really need to like, you know, commit my random act of kindness or go do my journaling exercise. It's not part of our 
conversation yet. But yet if we can make 20 minutes of investment in our mental health and our happiness, then we tip over our brains for the remainder of the day and everything else goes up. Like you said, it's the service profit chain, not a, not a, not a new concept, but, but from 20 years ago, we've always known that happy people at work perform better and as a result your sales your profit everything else lifts yeah that is a just a great perspective and you're right so many of these things are we know them they're yeah. intuitive but we don't do them for some reason and it's probably because we haven't been clear about what we need to do and it, it doesn't have to be giant big things it can be small things every day i think that's very good advice yeah and you know i, I think right now everyone's got a gym card in their in their in their wallet you pay fifty dollars <laughs> a month for this ticket to like going to lift weights no one's got um uh, a, a, a mental card. We've got a physical card, you know what I mean, that we pay money for, that we want to invest, but we don't have the equivalent for investing in our well-being. And so just thinking about that paradigm of like, I think we're at the tipping point of where happiness is going to go, where conversations like the one we're having today and exercises like the ones we're talking about today are going to become more commonplace. Yeah, I, I, I certainly hope so. And that's part of the reason why I uh, sort of write what I write and try and find people like you to interview and, 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 and share, share your views. You talk a lot about authenticity. Authenticity, um, and then you also talk a, a lot about happiness, and I certainly believe in both. Uh, but in the regular part of life, and I know you know this very well, um, uh, not everything is happy. Sometimes bad things happen to us. Uh, disappointments happen, maybe in small amounts, every single day. Uh, so, how would you recommend that we or I um, be authentic, yet at the same time be happy and positive when we have to deal with uh, bumps and bruises along the way? Yeah. To be sure, circumstances affect us. Um, again, I'm going to quote another piece of positive psychology literature that actually shows that our happiness is 50% genetic. Okay, so you have a genetic set point, identical twins. There's been studies on them. You know, one slightly happier than the other one, say. Uh, but then 10% of our remaining happiness is circumstances. Did you do you have a cold right now? Did someone pass away in your family, or did you get just get promoted at work or buy a new house? These are circumstances that affect us. The remaining forty percent on that pie chart is intentional activities, hmm. okay? Which means the greatest lever we have to control is that forty percent. It is some of those exercises that we've been talking about on what we can do to control our own positive well-being. So using that model and that framework, when you're having a, a bad day or a rough moment, I say that's okay. There is no such thing as an always full glass. In fact, the goal should not be to think of the glass as half full or half empty. It's just to know that it is refillable, you know? And so if you're having a bad day, and I have many, you just observe that it's bad, you know it will end, and you recognize that you will invest in your happiness when you can get out of it. I'm not one of these people that subscribes to the belief that like you can always be on or always have a good mood or always have a great day. I certainly don't. I don't know anyone that does. But being comfortable with that actually reduces anxiety about anxiety or worry about worry. And that alone lets the mood pass quicker. Yeah. Uh, that, again, great advice. I, I find you so um, very interesting, and I know early in your career um, or in your life, you had you had some challenges. How is it that you you came to these realizations? How is it that you came out of these doldrums and difficult times to have such incredible insights? Yeah, sure. I mean, listen, I um, my wife left me. You know, I was in a marriage that was heading in the wrong direction. Um, I'm one of the 50 percent you hear about, <laughs> you know, on, on marriages ending. It's unfortunate. And, I, and it caught me off guard and it was heartbreaking and all of those things. I don't wish it upon anyone. At the same time that was happening, um, my best friend was suffering from severe mental illness. And so um, we lost him. Fortunately, he sadly took his own life. And it was in that spirit and in that those days that I was looking for some way to cheer myself up. I had many bad days, of course, the people closest to my friends and, and did as well, but it's like, how do you turn something good out of this? And, um, you know, for me, I was looking at the newspaper, I was turning on television, and everything's always negative. There's always wars going on. There's always, like, some disaster. We have 7 billion people. There's always going to be 10 big problems yeah. on the cover of every paper, right? So I said to myself, I got to start this blog. 1000awesomethings.com and just the idea of it was daunting and I wrote about broccoli flower. My first entry is about nature's ugliest vegetable, the, the green cauliflower. So it's like, I didn't even know what I was doing, Peter. But over time, by investing in a small daily practice, which is the gratitude practice and the journaling practice combined, I became a bit of an outpost. People would send me their own awesome things. People would comment on my blog. The blog ended up getting 50 million hits, winning best blog in the world two years in a row and turning into a best-selling book. That's all because I chose to focus on something positive. And 
the d a tremendous amount of kind of luck and timing and all that stuff that goes into it. But for me, it's like, we're all going to go through bad days. I don't think my bad days are any worse than anybody else's. In fact, I, I know and have met a lot of people who have had much greater struggles than me. It's just about what's the one small thing you can do for a couple minutes in even the worst day to cheer yourself up. That's where the Book of Awesome and A Thousand Things came from. And on days I didn't have the energy to write them, I would try to read something like that or you know, expose myself to something small that's positive just to make sure my brain didn't kind of slip kind of way down past the point where I could help, help it. Yeah. 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 Uh, as I said, uh, it's, it's a great story and that's what made me excited to, you know, get the chance to meet you and talk to you today. So maybe one last question, which is I always like to get some advice, you know, that's going to help me. So, um, I, I'm, uh, I, I, I lead an organization that we have about a thousand employees and, uh, and a lot of people ask me for advice too. I mean, what is the one or two bits of advice you can give me as a leader of others yeah. to help facilitate for them what you are explaining to me right now. Yeah, sure. I have a really strong viewpoint on advice and it's a bit counterintuitive and here's and maybe sometimes controversial. The thing is there's a famous quote um, uh, from the 1800s that says when we are asking for advice, we're really looking for an accomplice. Okay, we're almost always looking for something to either agree with what we want or disagree with it so we can kind of stand firm in our viewpoint. You ask people what you should name your kid or what school you should go to, you might already have an idea in your mind. And so one day I was surfing through the newspaper and I noticed the cover of the New York Times and the cover of the Toronto Star, the biggest two newspapers in both countries, had the exact opposite advice on them. One said, um, no need to get extra vitamin D because there's been a study and a thousand people have been in this study and all the research says you don't need more vitamin D. The other newspaper said, go on the office and get your vitamin D. None of us are getting enough. The earth's tilting away from the sun. Like, guys, this is a big problem. And I'm like, it's, ex it's like huge credible news sources with studies backing both of them on the front page the same day showing the exact opposite advice. I start thinking about advice, the concept of advice, and start realizing that the most common advice of all is actually cliches. Right. So, so true that you just have them memorized and it's like, you know, the early bird gets the worm, right? But then you start thinking about it, you're like, or is it good things come to those who wait? <laughs> you know, and you start thinking, okay, well, is, it's, it's actions speak louder than words, right? Or is it the pen is mightier than the sword? And for every single cliche or piece of advice you've ever heard, there is an equal opposing piece of advice. So the biggest advice I leave anybody with is don't take advice. The answers are all inside you. You already know what to do. And anything you're seeking is just trying to confirm something you already believe. Forget it. You don't need the books. You don't need the newspapers. You don't need any advice. You already know what to do. Just do that. That is a fantastic viewpoint and not advice and one that I have not heard before and will make me go and think and I'm sure it will make others do the same. So listen, I got to say thank you very much for your time and for sh giving me the time and sharing uh, this specifically with me and to avoid a cliche, hey man, you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's my pleasure. It's a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Pleasure.